I'm Lena Hassanel and this is Nightline, news making the headlines. Government mouths further relaxation of SOPs once booster vaccination is completed. And vaccination for children below 12 years old, not compulsory, says Health Minister. Good morning. The government is mulling further relaxation of the standard operating procedures, SOPs, once the COVID-19 vaccination process in the country, including the administration of booster doses, is completed. Prime Minister Datuk Sri Ismail Sabri Yaakob said the matter, however, depends on the recommendations and advice from the Health Ministry, MOH. Jika rakyat kita telah pun diberikan booster, maka mungkin boleh kita relax sikit dari segi SOP kita. Walau mana pun seperti saya sebutkan bahawa Kementerian Kesihatan memb- perlu memberikan pandangan tentang perkara ini. Dan kita percaya apabila kita boleh membuka negara kita, keadaan ekonomi kita akan boleh berubah dan akan lebih bertambah baik. Datuk Seri Ismail Sabri said this when addressing the Prime Minister's department staff in Putrajaya on Tuesday. He also said if the SOPs were too rigid, it would definitely affect the national tourism industry. Although the domestic tourism sector had been reopened, he said foreign tourists had yet to be allowed to enter the country and wage subsidy was still being given to tourism industry players. He added even though the Malaysia Singapore vaccination travel lane VTL initiative had kicked off and the VTL discussions with Indonesia and Thailand had been initiated, the increasing number of COVID-19 cases overseas still caused Malaysia to suspend international travel. Datuk Sri Ismail Sabri pointed out that some countries had relaxed their SOPs for foreign tourists and that was something for Malaysia to consider, but it is still being cautious in reopening the country's borders due to the pandemic. He also reiterated that the government had no plan to impose another movement control order, MCO, to restrict the movement of the people and business sector. In the meantime, Datuk Sri Ismail Sabri said the delay in the distribution of compassionate aid, BWI, to flood victims who were not evacuated was mainly due to the existence of dubious applications. However, he said the matter will be resolved in the near future. Kita umumkan mereka yang tidak berpindah tetapi terkesan akibat banjir akan diberikan bantuan. Tetapi akhirnya terlalu ramai yang memohon dan agak meragukan. Jadi sebab itulah kita memerlukan tapisan daripada ketua-ketua kampung dan sebagainya. The Prime Minister said at present almost 100% of the heads of households evacuated to relief centres had received the BWI and the distribution of the aid was expected to be fully completed soon. He also said the aid for the purchase of necessities, vehicle repair and rebates on electrical goods to flood victims had also been distributed. On the same stage, Datuk Sri Ismail Sabri also reminded all staff in the Prime Minister's Department, JPM, to work honestly and with integrity and to intensify efforts to promote the concept of Keluarga Malaysia. With almost all national policies focusing on the JPM, he said the department should be the exemplary model to other ministries and the people in the implementation of the policies. The COVID-19 immunization program for children, or PICKITS, which will commence next month, is not compulsory. Health Minister Kairi Jamaluddin also assured that no restrictions will be imposed on children who do not get the COVID-19 vaccine. In a post on his official Twitter account on Tuesday, Kyrie explained that unvaccinated children will not face restrictions similar to adults who chose not to get vaccinated. However, he urged parents to register their children for pick kits through the My Sejahtera application to protect them from COVID-19. The government will be inoculating children aged between 5 and 11 years old with pediatric doses of Pfizer-BioNTech's Comirnaty vaccine, which is proven to be safe and effective. The program will be rolled out in stages, beginning with children residing in the Klang Valley. 
It will kick off at Tunku Aziza Hospital in Kuala Lumpur on February 3rd. Meanwhile, in a separate tweet, Kairi said that the ministry agrees with the view of the Prime Minister that there will not be lockdown restrictions anymore. He also said that the standard operating procedures, SOP, will be relaxed from time to time. And if there are restrictions, it will be targeted, temporary and proportionate. Highway users could soon use any digital payment platforms to pay tools, not just touch and go. Senior Works Minister Datuk Sri Fadila Yusuf said this, however, would depend on when the radio frequency identification RFID penetration rate has reached a satisfactory level. According to Datuk Sri Fadila, highway users can choose any digital mode of payment, such as touch and go e-wallet, debit or credit card, and will only need one RFID tag for this purpose. It would be implemented once highway concessionaries are ready to integrate additional online payment providers to their toll system. Datuk Sri Fadila revealed the highway concessionaries have also been instructed to be prepared to implement a multi-lane free flow MLFF system by 2025. The senior minister also said the use of touch-and-go card to pay highway tolls would be phased out in 2025, followed by the smart tag lane. It is estimated that over 20 million touch-and-go cards are currently in circulation, and more than 90 percent of toll payments on 31 highways in the country are made using the cards. The health of former Prime Minister to Dr. Mahathir Mohamad, who is being treated at the National Heart Institute, IJN, showed improvement on Tuesday. His daughter, Datin Paduka Marina, said in a statement on Tuesday to Dr. Mahathir's appetite had improved and he could joke with family members who were by his side. She also said that to Dr. Mahathir told the public not to be unduly worried about his health condition, adding that her father would continue to be treated at IJN under the watch of local specialists. She added that Tun Dr. Mahathir and the family are also very touched and would like to thank everyone for their prayers for a speedy recovery. For now, the IJN has not allowed any visitors other than close family members to see the Langkawi Member of Parliament. Malaysia is committed to continuing fighting modern slavery so that its victims can be protected. Home Minister Datuk Sri Hamza Zainuddin said that the government's focus is not solely on managing the entry of foreign workers, but looking at effective methods to reduce the problem of human trafficking and forced labour. I have to issue modern slavery in human trafficking, in forced labour, in this issue, it's a holistic. Datuk Sri Hamza explained that human trafficking and forced labour are cross-border issues that occur in many countries. But the matter was still unresolved, despite various laws being enacted by the International Labour Organization. He said this at a dinner with more than 100 strong Malaysian diaspora in Jakarta on Monday night, in conjunction with his working visit to the country. As part of his visit, Datuk Sri Hamza had a meeting with his Indonesian counterpart, Muhammad Tito Karnavian, and Minister of Marine Affairs and Fisheries, Sakti Wahyu Trengono. He noted that both countries have agreed to combat illegal fishing in the two countries' territorial waters via joint patrols. The young people who are now given the opportunity to vote with the implementation of Undi 18 have been urged to exercise their right responsibly. Youth and Sports Minister Datuk Sri Ahmad Faisal Azumu said the right should be used well and taken seriously by them for their own future and the country's interests. He said the country will see the implementation of Undi 18 and the Johor state election soon, and he looks forward to seeing how the young voters, aged 18 and above, will exercise their new rights. The Federal Government Gazette, dated December 1st, stated that the automatic registration of voters, aged 18 and above, came into effect on December 15th last year. With the implementation of Undi 18, there will be an increase of about 700,000 new voters from among the young people eligible to vote in the upcoming Johor state election, bringing the total number of registered voters in the state to about 2.5 million. 
In Serdang, Selangor, five vehicles were damaged after a landslide in the Lestari Perdana area on Tuesday evening. Selangor Fire and Rescue Department Director Nor Azam Kamis said they received a distress call at about 6.40 p.m. Six firefighters and officers from the Serdang Fire Station were immediately rushed to the scene. Fortunately, no victims were involved in the incident. Still to come, 3.5 million ringgit worth of drugs seized. Stay with us. Welcome back. Malaysia dropped five spots in the Transparency International Corruption Perception Index CPI 2021 to 62nd position out of 180 countries in terms of public sector corruption. Transparency International Malaysia President Dr. Mohamed Mohan said among the reasons why Malaysia digressed from its path was due to stalled institutional reforms. He also said there has been no progress on reforms to the Malaysian Anti-Corruption Commission, MACC's recommendations in 2015. The other issues, he added, was on discharge not amounting to acquittal for high-profile personalities in corruption cases and a continued lack of political will from various administrations in fighting corruption. Dr. Mohammed, however, said that there were positive developments such as the signing of the Bipartisan Cooperation Memorandum of Understanding between Prime Minister Datuk Sri Ismail Sabri Yaakob and Pakatan Harapan last year. The government also reduced the minimum voting age to 18 and introduced automatic voter registration as well as gave its commitment to resolve matters arising from the Malaysia Agreement MA63. The United Arab Emirates, UAE, will contribute 1.3 million Sinopharm COVID-19 vaccine doses to Malaysia this year. Foreign Minister Datuk Saifuddin Abdullah said Malaysia extended its gratitude and appreciation to the Crown Prince of Abu Dhabi, Sheikh Mohammed Zayed Al Nahyan, and the UAE Embassy in Kuala Lumpur for the generous contribution. Terima kasih kepada uh, His Royal Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed Al Nahyan, Putra Mahkota uh, Abu Dhabi, yang telah uh, menyampaikan sumbangan ini kepada kerajaan dan rakyat Malaysia. He said this after witnessing the arrival of the first 500,000 doses of the vaccine at Kuala Lumpur International Airport, KLIA, on Tuesday. 
Also present was the Chargé d'Affaires of the UAE Embassy in Kuala Lumpur, Nouf Ibrahim Ali Rashid al Kuwaiti. Noor said the remaining 500,000 Sinopharm doses would be submitted to Malaysia within the coming two weeks. Previously, the UAE had donated 20,000 units of antigen rapid test kits to Malaysia in March 2020 and seven tons of hand sanitizers in May 2020 that were specifically made for Wisma Putra's diplomatic frontliners serving in Malaysia and missions abroad. The Bukit Aman Narcotics Criminal Investigation Department, NCID, have seized various types of drugs worth over 3.5 million ringgit in the Op Tapis Khas operation that took place from January 21st to 23rd. Its director, Datu Ayub Khan Maiden Piche, said 5,200 individuals, including 942 drug peddlers, were arrested after 367 drug dens were raided during the operation conducted nationwide. According to Datu Ayub Khan, all those detained comprised 4,987 men and 213 women, aged between 13 and 60, including teenagers and foreigners. Dalam operasi ini juga, sejumlah 212 kilogram dadah dan 1,199 liter pelbagai jenis dadah telah menjadi rampas nilai keseluruhan RM3.5 juta dan berbagai dadah alat heroin, syabu, ketamin dan sebagainya. Datu Ayub Khan said the police seized a revolver during an operation in Pera, apart from a homemade rifle in Sarawak and Negeri Sembilan. Cops also seized jewelries and vehicles worth more than 2.3 million ringgit. The United Kingdom, UK and the Commonwealth countries, including Malaysia, share strong and deep relations across many areas, such as climate change, biodiversity, empowering youth and education. And this connection continues to be strengthened through sports, particularly through the 16th Queen's Baton Relay in conjunction with the upcoming Commonwealth Games in July this year. Our trainee reporter, Kesha Vartini Saga, reports. The Queen's Baton, which is a trip across the 72 Commonwealth countries and territory, arrived at Taylor's University campus in Subang Jaya, Selangor on Monday, which is the last stop in the Malaysian lake of its journey. Prior to this, it has visited Pera and Putrajaya as well as 29 other countries. The Queen's Baton Relay, which carries a special message from Queen Elizabeth II to the Commonwealth, is not just about the game but also brings people together to help solve various global challenges such as tackling climate change. The Commonwealth Games is trying to lead the way. It's going to be the first ever carbon neutral Commonwealth Games. Um, but more broadly, the Commonwealth has a climate change program and that supports mitigation and adaptation projects right across Commonwealth countries. But I think more than that, it's the responsibility of every individual in the Commonwealth to take action on climate change. That's never been more important. The theme for this year's Commonwealth is also sustainability, and this was evident through the involvement of scientists from the University of Birmingham in helping to design the baton. Environmental scientists have incorporated a high-tech heart into the Queen's baton, which has sensor to collect atmospheric data throughout its journey. The data collected will be used as a part of ongoing projects and spark dialogues on air quantity across the Commonwealth. For baton barriers, the experience of being involved in the Queen's baton relay was certainly unforgettable as it was once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Uh, I would say that I'm very happy that I'm able to participate, especially in this uh, event, because of the theme sustainability. And the reason why is because this theme specifically resonates well with my beliefs, which is providing education for the underprivileged and my projects on um, fulfilling the SDG on health care. The Queen's Baton will next visit Brunei and other 42 countries before returning back to the UK. The opening ceremony of Commonwealth Games will take place at Birmingham on July 28. Kesha Ratini Sagar, TV3. Russia possible deployment, US Armed Forces on high alert. This and more when we return. Menarik sepatutnya.
front. The Japanese government's advisory panel on Tuesday has set to approve the expansion of stricter anti-COVID-19 measures to 18 additional regions, putting over 70 percent of the country under restrictions. The curbs will be enforced from Thursday until February 20th, empowering re regional governors to request restaurants and bars to shorten their business hours and restrict alcohol sales. Osaka and Kyoto prefectures in western Japan are among the areas to be covered by the measures. The decision came after Japan recorded more than 54,000 new COVID cases on Saturday, the highest ever driven by the infectious Omicron variant. Meanwhile, neighboring country South Korea reported more than 8,000 new coronavirus infections for the first time on Tuesday as the highly contagious Omicron variant spreads rapidly, despite the extension of tough social distancing rules. The Korea Disease Control and Prevention Agency, KDCA, recorded 8,571 cases for Monday, exceeding the previous peak posted in mid-December of 7,848. The new record came amid the spread of the more transmissible Omicron variant, which became dominant in the country last week. With Omicron spreading more than twice as fast as the Delta strain that caused the last surge, experts say new cases may exceed 10,000 this week, and possibly 20,000 after the Chinese New Year's holiday break. To date, the nation has recorded 733,902 COVID-19 infections and 6,540 deaths. London police on Tuesday said they were investigating allegations of Downing Street lockdown parties in 2020 to determine if UK government officials violated coronavirus restrictions, putting further pressure on British Prime Minister Boris Johnson. Metropolitan Police Commissioner Cressida Dick said the force was looking into potential breaches of lockdown rules over the last two years, not only at Johnson's Downing Street offices and residents, but in other government offices in London as well. My officers have assessed several other events that appear to have taken place at Downing Street and Whitehall. On the available information, these other events are assessed as not reaching the threshold for criminal investigation. Throughout the pandemic, the Met has sought to take, as I have said, a proportionate approach. I should stress that the fact that we are now investigating does not, of course, mean that fixed penalty notices will necessarily be issued in every instance and to every person involved. According to the number 10, more than 30 people had gathered briefly to wish Johnson a happy birthday, adding that he had been there for less than 10 minutes. The opposition Labour Party has said the parties show that Johnson and his staff ignored rules that they imposed on the British people. Some 8,500 United States troops have been put on heightened alert for a possible deployment to Eastern Europe as Russian troops mass on Ukraine's border. Pentagon spokesman John Kirby on Monday said the bulk of U.S. troops placed on high alert were intended to bolster NATO's quick response force. He added the American forces being put on standby would be in addition to the significant combat-capable U.S. forces already based in Europe to deter aggression and enhance the alliance's ability to, def to defend allies and defeat aggression if necessary. The nation has taken steps to heighten the readiness of its forces at home and abroad, so they are prepared to respond to a range of contingencies, including support to the NATO response force if it is activated. Meanwhile, Russia has repeatedly denied planning to invade despite massing 100,000 troops nearby and has blamed the West for stoking tensions. BAM Zijia crisis resolved. The details in sports segment after this breather.
Li Zijia finally got his wish granted to become an independent shuttler. The 23-year-old All-England champion took to his social media account to announce that he would be allowed to pursue a professional career after resolving the issue with the Badminton Association of Malaysia, BAM. Zijia in a Facebook posting on Tuesday said he had a private hot-to-hot -hot meeting with BAM president Tansri Norza Zakaria together with his parents and pleased to announce that the issue has been resolved after receiving Tansri Norza's blessings to become a professional player. Zijia was believed to have met Tansri Norza to thresh out a deal to exempt him from a two-year sanction on Monday before a subsequent meeting was held between the former, his representatives and BAM top officials that included Second Deputy President Datuk Sri Jahabardin Muhammad Yunus and Secretary Datuk Kenny Goh on Tuesday morning. Kami sudah ada perbincangan dan sepasti-pastinya Lizija happy, uh, BAM pun boleh terima dan uh, adalah bagus untuk negara. Itu yang paling penting sekali. Ya, seperti mana yang kita terangkan dulu, tidak ada permusuhan di antara BAM dengan sesiapa pun. Jadi yang ada cumalah dari segi dulu uh, apa ni, penarikan Zijia, tak ada pendaftaran. Tapi sekarang semua dah okey dah sebab kita dah lalui proses rayuan. Saya hari ini untuk update uh, appeal letter saya dan kita pun uh, have a sangat positif punya conclusion lah. Then which uh, I think BM will be announced in next week lah. The Shuttler also announced that he would be donning the national colours for the upcoming Badminton Asia Team Championships in Shah Alam from February 15th to 20th, which served as the Thomas and Uber Cup Finals qualifiers. Turning to tennis, the Australian Open. Rafael Nadal claimed a spot in the semi-final for the seventh time after beating Denis Shapovalov in a five-set thriller. Nadal had a good start as he took the first two sets 6-3, 6-4. Shapovalov, however, found his rhythm and won the next two sets 6-4, 6-3, forcing the match to be dragged into a decider. Nadal then used all his experience to stay calm en route to sealing a 6-3 victory and a place in the last four. In the women's category, Madison Keys became the first player into the semifinals at Melbourne Park after beating French Open champion Barbora Kerchikova 6-3, 6-2. The win continues a resurgent 2022 for Keys, who won only 11 matches in all of 2021. Keys will play either top-ranked Ash Bhatti or Jessica Pegula in the semi-finals. And that's it for Nightline this time around. As we wrap up, we leave you with this drone footage showing Athens and its ancient monuments blanketed by heavy snow. The blizzard also brought chaos to the roads and forced flight cancellations. With that, I'm Lena Hassanel. Thanks for watching and stay safe, Malaysia.